happy to be here today and to lend my voice at such a wonderful conference and share my story with all of you. I was 12 years old when the war broke out in my country, Bosnia. And before the war, I was just a cheerful, carefree girl growing up in a middle class family in the capital city, Sarajevo, living with my brother, my parents. I loved music, I loved going to school, seeing all my friends. Then everything changed at the start of the war in 1992. Before the war, Sarajevo was most famous to the world for hosting the 1984 Winter Olympics. Unfortunately, everything changed in that morning of April 6th of 1992. I was 12, and that morning, I vividly remember it, in fact, I got up, I got dressed, ready to go to school. I entered my family's living room with the backpack on, and I noticed that my parents were somehow troubled and sad. I could just see that something was wrong. So I just asked them, I said, what's the matter? And I barely heard my mom whisper to me. She said, Nadja, you're not going to school today. I said, well, great, it's a holiday, right? I must have forgotten about some holiday. She said, no, no, it's perhaps the farthest thing from a holiday. And she was right. That was the first day of the war. And instead of going to school that day and seeing all my friends, I sat in front of a television set with my brother, Sonny, and my parents, watching these strange and disturbing images of armed men with sock masks on their heads. They were placing barricades throughout the city and blocking the streets. So that's why I couldn't go to school. That's why my parents never went to work. Looking at this, those images as a 12-year-old girl who was so sheltered up until that point, living in a peaceful country, I didn't quite see a difference between reality and a Hollywood action movie. I didn't get it. But the reality definitely sunk in the next morning. These deafening explosions and whistling of bullets all around our apartment building frightened us. My family lived in a 22-story apartment building. We had a 14-floor apartment, and we found it shaking that morning from all the explosions outside. Some were direct hits to our building. So we were scared, we were frightened. Also, the electricity was cut off, so we couldn't take an elevator down, and within a single hour, all 270 tenants started running down the staircases, trying to make this mad dash towards these three underground rooms that we had as basements. Now these rooms, they were just dark and damp, dirty, filled with discarded furniture and things that people wanted to throw out. And all of a sudden, we had to cram in. And these rooms were by no means you know, big enough to comfortably hold 270 people, but these were our only havens, safe from the explosions outside. So I remember all of us cramming in, and I just found myself a corner of the ground just to sit on. I looked above me, and the ceiling was shaking from all the explosions. And I was so scared. I could write hundreds of books and give thousands of speeches, and never truly be able to explain to you how I felt in those moments. It felt like the whole building was going to collapse on top of us. And all I wanted was just to run outside of myself and hide. But at the same time, I was 12. I was very naive and innocent and optimistic, and I thought, you know, surely this crazy sounds above me, this madness, this chaos, it will just pass right through our city, and everything will get back to its normal state again. Well, I could not have been more wrong, because a month and a half later, we were still living in those basements. So for a month and a half, my family, my neighbors, and I, we practically lived like rats in darkness and damp, with very little light, very little food. And after about a month and a half, we couldn't hold, hold on anymore. We couldn't take it emotionally. We didn't have any food left. Even dry food, like crackers and jam, they were gone. So we decided as a community of 270 people that we would climb up the staircases again, and that we would go into our apartments again. We'd insist on sleeping in our own beds, even though it wasn't safe. And we definitely have to go to the streets to get food and water. So I remember that day climbing up 14 flights of stairs. And every step of the way, I was praying that we had an apartment left. After a month and a half of explosions, we weren't sure if there was a 14th floor to our building. So I rushed into our apartment to find that all the windows in our apartment were shattered, pieces of broken glass everywhere. In my room, pieces of bombshell called shrapnel and bullets. They were all over my bed and my desk. But everything else was still there. Our apartment was intact. 
So my dad, he went from room to room, and he taped up our windows with plastic sheets to keep the cold and the draft from coming in. And we started living again. But life was cheaper than a slice of bread, a cup of water, a random piece of wood. And at any point in the streets of once Olympic City, now there was more blood flowing than there was ever water. You see, for three and a half years, we were entirely, entirely encircled by tanks and weapons. We were practically prisoners in, inside a capital. And that's the kind of experience that marked my childhood and marks very much who I am today as an adult. Now, before I share some of my stories, I wanted to give you a statistic. I find it mind-boggling. They say that about 2.5 million bombs were launched into Sarajevo. When calculated with the population of the city at the time, that means that eight bombs were sent for every living citizen. Eight bombs to kill or cripple my mom. Eight bombs to kill or cripple my dad. Eight bombs for me. Seven missed me and one hit just a few feet away from me and wounded my legs and I still carry seven little pieces of shrapnel in my legs and forever will. And I must say, as sad as that experience was, I'm so grateful that I survived. So I want to read to you from my book about that day. I was 13 at the time. On the sunny and strangely quiet morning of October 18th, I begged my mom to let me go outside. I desperately needed some warm sun. I begged and cried until she gave in. Just for a moment, all right, she said, Already out the door, I barely heard her. I flew down all 14 flights of stairs. Outside, I just stood still, mesmerized by the beauty of the world. Suddenly, there was an explosion. Smoke and dust were everywhere. I frantically looked around. Finally, through thick smoke, I saw a large piece of our building dangling in front of me. I ran towards the entrance, screaming and crying. I touched my leg, and I felt blood. I also felt a sharp, stabbing pain in my legs, but I kept running until I found a neighbor. I threw my arms around her neck, and she dragged me to her door. Soon, a dozen neighbors crowded around trying to help. I was half conscious, but I could hear them through the confusion. Some were screaming, some were trying to talk to me. I didn't dare look at my legs, even though the neighbors had already wrapped them with towels to slow down the bleeding. I saw my blood on the walls and on the floor. At the hospital, a nurse put me on a stretcher and took me into a large room filled with the dead and wounded. All the beds and stretchers, as well as the floor, were covered with bodies. The boy next to me was having a piece of shrapnel taken out of his back without an aesthetic. He kept trying to muffle his moaning by covering his mouth. He was so incredibly brave, so I stopped crying. Eventually, the doctor rushed over to me. He slit open my pants and examined my legs. I had lost a lot of blood, but my bones were not damaged, so they didn't have to amputate my legs. I began to cry. After an hour or so, my father's friend happened to drive by the hospital. He offered us a ride home. As he and Dad carried me into the car, crimson stains blossomed through the bandages. Again, I was rushed to the doctor, who put another set of bandages over the two previous layers. When we made it to our building, my 18-year-old brother, Sonny, ran over, took me into his arms, and started crying like a child. Only then did I truly realize how much we love each other. He carried me up all 14 flights of stairs. Painful days and sleepless nights